Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are uh, all around the world. I welcome you to today's Ocarino webinar. My name is Jan Bundesmann. I'm a consultant here at ATEX and I'm mainly involved in stuff all around Ocarino. I work a lot with the configuration management tools and also have a strong focus on container technologies. And today it's my pleasure to guide you through this uh, Ocarino webinar. The topic of today is lifecycle uh, release patch management in Ocarino. Um, just a few words about the general um, agenda. So we have uh, my colleague Maximilian Korb um, in the chat. If you have any questions at any moment, just post them in the chat or use this questions and answers function that uh, Zoom is offering. Maximilian would either instantly reply to your questions, try to clarify what exactly you are um, asking for, and if he cannot answer them directly or if it's better, if he thinks it's better to post the questions to me directly, he will repeat them at the end of either the first section um, or the second section. Um, we have two sections. So the first one is like short general part about who we are and what Ocarino can do. Um, and the second part is um, a demonstration about lifecycle management, patch management in Ocarino. Well, let's start with a short introduction. <clears throat> Just a disclaimer here. Um, so what do we do at ATIX? We have one main goal, let's say. That's, it's, um, we want to help you or our customers in general um, to automate their data center. And we are, have a lot of expertise with different techniques. Um, I think this whole business starts a bit with configuration management tools. We uh, have focused on, on mainly Puppet and Ansible salt stack, but actually we have expertise in a lot of them. Um, and nowadays, um, there are more techniques, more like general techniques, but also um, very important, well, not so new anymore, but there was a rather new technique all around the containers. Started with Docker. I mean, containers have existed for a longer time, but of course Docker really, um, brought the, the big breakthrough. Um, <clears throat> so these techniques help in every aspect of configuration management, release management, deploy management. But um, still the question is why do we need them at all? We think that it's important to automate as much as possible for several reasons. Um, not only because it's more comfortable, but also because it helps you speed up deployments, which is like an economic factor nowadays, business factor, because you are, let's say, um, forced to deploy as fast, as much as possible. But um, automation also helps to make your software more stable. Um, you can also automate your whole testing cycle. Um, you do not mistype any commands, things like these. Um, at the same time, this also offers uh, reproducibility and eventually only with automation, you can orchestrate services. And let's say the, the highest, the, the last step of automation is to enable real self service so that you can go to the background, your users can choose the services they require by themselves. And to this end, we have developed one tool. <clears throat> which is um, the Ocarino, which is our central tool, let's say. I mean, we, we also know a lot of possibilities to automate as much as possible without Ocarino, but Ocarino can help in a lot of tasks. Um, and in this first part of the webinar, I shortly try to explain what actually Ocarino is. So this is just a rough sketch. So what techniques enter into Ocarino, so you see a lot of um, cloud providers, you see virtualization software, you see again the um, 
operation in the configuration management tools and you see different um, Linux distributions, but that's not everything which Ocarino is. There's also like the, the human factor. And from our side, that's the that means we have consulting, training, support, engineering, and everything. Um, and Ocarino tries to help you with the three functions, let's say. Um, or other way around, um, Ocarino has three main key features, um, which we label as deployment, configuration management, and release management. So this is really everything Ocarino is built around. And I want to go shortly into detail what I mean with these three key features. But it's really important to, to stress that this is the key thing, and there's a lot of, of things built around those key features. So let's start with deployment. It is possible to use the Ocarino, which offers several, let's say, interfaces. You have a web interface, but you also some APIs or command line interfaces to deploy new machines. And with new machines, I refer to both bare metal servers and virtual machines. And we have several techniques um, how this can be done. Basically, um, you have to see it from two sides. First is how does the information of the new operating system um, get to your host and the other one is um, specific techniques how the operating system then can be installed unalternately. Um, so an, an easy thing is that you just have some kind of boot image which is the, the bottom line here in this graph where you can see discovery ESO. Um, which is a way which is very suitable, for example, for bare metal servers. So you can kind of um, install it on a, on a USB stick. It then boots and automatically finds the Ocarino and then can grab the information it, need, it needs for installing the, the base operating system. Another way would be that you um, start a new machine uh, and use DHCP so it can automatically through the DSCP mechanisms, Pixie Boot, obtain all the relevant information. If you have a virtual machine, you can also um, push something like a boot disk to your hypervisor, which then starts the operating system installation. Um, or of course, you can like use classical virtual machine uh, template-based deployment. So this is always the first step. You have some server which has to know that there is something like Ocarino. And then afterwards, we have uh, implemented templating mechanism um, for automated installation of um, different operating systems um, for the Linux distributions. The, the mechanisms, the techniques that are working in the background are called Kickstart, Preseed, or Autoyast, depending on if you're using Red Hat, CentOS, uh, Debian-like operating systems, or SUSE. And um, there are also techniques to use that, for example, on, on Windows. And what these do is they install a base system and also prepare it to also later on interact with the Ocarina. And then of course, well, deployment is over and other techniques take over. And then that's the point where release management and configuration management take place. So let's have a, have a click, quick view at release management. We will have a look in more detail later in the, in the demo. Um, what we mean by release management is we can use the Ocarino to synchronize repositories from different sources and different types of repositories. Typically, these are YUM or DEP mirrors. So we synchronize, for example, from SUSE using some plugin to authenticate against the SUSE customer center or from Debian or whatever. Um, we from Atix, we also provide something called security orator. I don't go into detail right now because um, there's also a place to do this later. Um, but the important point is that we have these synchronized repositories and then we can publish snapshots from certain points in time. These are called content views. And each host that we manage through Ocarino now gets offered a certain content view. So a repository version from a certain point in time. This helps you to keep the software stable. And 
it also includes through these errata to apply security patches, for example. I, you, you will see this later in the demonstration. Configuration management means um, you have some kind of central server um, in that they have specific names uh, depending on the tool you're using, Puppet, Solstack, Ansible. Um, but in some kind, there are some, some master machines where you gather uh, all the information about how your host shall be configured, like which configuration files shall exist, which services shall, shall run, which um, packages shall be installed, and so on. Um, and you, again, can use the Ocarino as a, as a central for controlling this configuration management, for setting up the roles, classes, states, whatever. So this is like the, the really sophisticated config management. Of course, we had already the, the basic installation, already that is part, kind of a configuration management. Um, you can also just start um, SSH calls to your hosts, um, which uh, is also prepared during deployment. So during deployment, um, a valid SSH key gets de gets deposited on your managed host and then through the Ocarino, you can um, connect directly to the host and run individual commands. And then we also wrote something about OpenSCAP. OpenSCAP is, is, well, it's not really configuration management, but it's also kind of subsumed in this topic because OpenSCAP is a com compliance policy reporting tool which gets installed through one of the other configuration management tools, then scans your host regularly for violations of security compliance rules and reports it back to the Ocarina. So this is an important tool for security audits, for example. So these were the, the three main features, um, things you can do with a software or Carino. Um, so, but when I refer to Ocarino, it's a bit more. So in the, in the base thing, we have several packages, software tools. Um, the center, of course, is Foreman, an open source software um, with a very important plugin Catalo. Um, those two things are then packaged and bundled by us. Uh, we are um, also bundling the, the or packaging the rest and testing um, different versions of these softwares together. And we also have an engineering department. We are developing new plugins, um, new functions inside the software. Um, we are also delivering it back upstream. So we really um, appreciate this open source idea because we are also profiting, of course, um, because we are not the only ones developing for Foreman. Um, for our customers, this always means they can kind of influence how and on which direction we are developing new stuff for Foreman Catalo. And of course, they might get things a bit faster than upstream because upstream always means we have to um, bring our com commits through the community um, reviewing process. So um, we have an engineering, we also test the different kinds of, of, of tools that are included in this um, bundle or Carino. Um, we provide something specifically for our customer, basically um, this is the errata. So errata is these um, information about security vulnerabilities, which is out of the box provided by SUSE, Oracle, and Red Hat. And we also provide them for CentOS 7, for Debian and Ubuntu. Then we also provide client software for all of those operating systems. Um, our customers have uh, access to our support, so they can uh, open support tickets and request information. And of course, we offer consulting around that. Consulting means specific tasks can be implemented. Um, and we also, as part of the consulting, offer trainings. And this whole construct is what I call Ocarino. It's not only just a piece of software, it has uh, many things that enter this. Okay, 
so many words about Ocarino and the Apex. Um, if you have any questions at this moment, um, feel free to ask them. Um, otherwise, I would go on with the demo about life cycle and release management in Ocarino. So this is, um, let's say, my starting point with I, when I work with Ocarino. So um, for some of you, well, you might be more familiar working on the on the browser. Of course, there is also a way of, of doing all these things in, on the console. But like for presentation, it's always easier to show it in this um, web UI. So this is the overview of the host attached to our demo system. Um, you can see um, that we have um, hosts uh, of all kinds of operating systems. You see all the major Linux distributions. distributions. You see also Windows Server. Um, actually, the, the deployment of Windows servers is the topic of the next webinar. And I, I think this will be very interesting. This will be helped by one of my colleagues who is an expert on automatic deployment of Windows. Um, so for me, this is the starting point, as I said, because this gives me an overview over the hosts in uh, my environment and a quick overview about their status. So you see, for example, they all are powered on and um, you see their names and uh, some of them have some red icon. Some of them have a green icon. The green icon means everything is all right. The red icon means, oh, maybe I should do something. Um, we will have a look at this later. And I think the, the first interesting thing is um, that we can easily create a new host. Create a new host here means um, we start a virtual machine in our VMware cluster. So I give this some name. Webinar demo is already suggested. <clears throat> um, I don't go into the detail of the host deployment. I just say I want to deploy some Ubuntu 18.04 production. Um, I choose a host group. A host group technically means that um, all those values get pre-filled and it also gets saved as a kind of a sorting um, parameter. Okay, you have seen um, we now end up in some lifecycle environment. It's deployed on some vCenter. We have a compute profile and so on. A lot of settings. Again, I won't go into detail. I just click on submit. What happens now is the, the machine is um, yeah, created. The instance is created and it boots through DHCP, gets all the installation data and now will take some minutes until the host is up. But all this communication between Ocarino and uh, the VM, the, the vCenter API happens automatically in the background. This is also possible for some cloud providers and for example, for Overt or KVM or Proxmox. Okay, this was just a quick sketch. We will have a look at this host later. Let's just have a look what else we can do. We see here in the left hand side our menus and the three main functions of the Ocarino are um, already kind of, um, let's say, encoded in the menu because we have configure, host and content. These are the three main functions. The rest is basically administration of Ocarino itself. Here in configure, you see we have three entries, Puppet, Ansible and Salt. This is the area where you can have a closer look at the configuration management, where you can set up which environments we have for Puppet or Salt. For Ansible, we have no such a concept as uh, an environment. You can configure which classes you have in Puppet. Um, you can group classes, uh, which is basically, if you're familiar with the Puppet, um, what you would do with profiles in a pure Puppet environment. And you have variables and class parameters. This replaces the um, HERA database in Puppet on the command line. So for Ansible, you can manage the installed roles and the corresponding variables. And the same basically for salt, you can see which states are present on your system and variables. For all these cases, Ocarino scans through predefined folders and sees what is inside there. 
Okay, this is just a quick um, overview about the configuration management. The host part um, basically is concerned with the topic host deployment and, well, to a certain degree, also inventory management. Um, you see here several things about provisioning setup. So we could set up where our installation media is located. Um, typically, like um, you have a new URL from where the host can obtain an installation medium. You would set up which operating systems you try to de deploy through Ocarina. This template part um, defines all the, the templates that get, like, get later rendered to define how the systems are provisioned and, for example, partitioned. And of course, we have these oval hosts. This is where we can find the managed hosts. Discovered host is something a bit more special. I, I told already in this um, slide about this host deployment that we have the possibility to start a discovery image, which then automatically finds the Ocarina and create host is what we just did. Content host is something we will have a closer look in the very near future. Okay, and content is the topic of today, let's say. Um, there is something conceptual, not so easy. So we'll, we'll try to explain in, in my way of seeing it. Um, we have a lot of menu points here. Um, let's ignore the first three things because this is basically about um, well, subscription management, as you can already see. Um, but I think on a lower level, we should have a look at the products and ignore the, the topic about subscription management for a moment. So products is uh, something, some kind of meta level to organize the content that is, that is present in our Ocarina. So you can already see we have here a list of products that are synchronized to the Ocarina. From the names, you can see it's mainly operating systems, but there are some other things like, for example, EPL or Puppet in several versions, or later on, there will also be Salt Stack. So from the name, you can already assume that we have some software and some operating systems if we, for example, click on one of, of the products, let's choose the Ubuntu 18.04. A product basically is a collection of repositories. That's how I would see it. Um, combined with some plan when these repositories shall be synchronized. So we see here Ubuntu 18.04, its code name is Bionic. And we have uh, three repositories, like the, the, the operating system itself, the security branch, and the updates. You see on the right hand side how many packages are inside these repositories. And then we have those smaller things that we add by hand to provide certain dependencies. You see also that uh, there is a sync status um, only for the first three of them because they get synchronized automatically, which means 10 hours ago this night, um, there has happened some synchronization and we currently have the version from 10 hours ago on the Ocarina, but we also have older versions. And this is like all this, uh, let's say a bit complicated concept of release management in Ocarina. Because we can organize the versions in different life cycles, and that's why I want to go to content life cycle. And you see, we have um, this life cycle, several menu points. Um, this is the nomenclature used for organizing the package versions. If you click on life cycle environment, I hope this will get a bit clearer. So we have a very straightforward way of labeling our life cycle environments. We have only one path. It's possible to have new paths, but uh, we just say we have systems that are either relevant for development, for testing or for, 
production. And the idea is that development always has the most rapid changes while production only gets changes that are well tested. So the idea is we have some servers, they belong to different environments. Um, we have the production service which are really the ones where the software eventually runs on. We have some development machines where you want to have more bleeding edge tools in the background. Um, and we have the testing machines in between, which should be already quite close to production. And then <clears throat> everything I will explain now helps to attribute those different versions of the repositories to these lifecycle environments. And how is this done? So this is actually the part where this formal plugin called Catalo comes in. This is all doing all the heavy lifting, let's say, because this is caring for all this. Technically, <clears throat> um, it creates links linked states of um, your repository at a certain time. Um, this is done through something called content views. So we will go a bit into detail here. Content view, <clears throat> if we go to this list, <clears throat> sorry, um, will look quite similar to what we already had in the products overview, but we have some <clears throat> different entries, of course. Um, let's just, st just straight away with the Ubuntu content view. So you remember we had the product Ubuntu containing five repositories. Um, if you look carefully, you might also have seen that there are other Ubuntu products. Um, a content view now creates snapshots of these repositories. And if I open my view of my content view, I see that there are several versions. And you see that they have a publication date. This happens, well, kind of regularly, let's say, um, roughly once a month. But um, of course, there has to be a reason um, why we publish a new version. And now, each version represents the included repositories at exactly this date. And then you see a version can be attributed to a certain environment. This is also important. Um, here you see it's only attributed to library. I did not mention library when we were having a look at the lifecycle environments because library is something a bit peculiar. Um, it's like the, the latest in other kinds of software. So in library, you will always find the, the most recent piece of software. Okay, and you see also some information about how many packages are inside these different versions of our content. You see the numbers differ, of course, and the errata is also constantly growing. Um, And eventually, I will shortly um, just jump to this point activation keys and I will go back to content use later to, to better understand it. Oh no. First, let's go to the repositories because this may be interesting which repositories are actually included into this content view. Okay, you see, in this case, it's just the five content, uh, the five repositories we had inside the product Ubuntu 18.04. I could add other repositories also for other operating systems. Um, so you can also combine different products inside one content view. And then eventually we go to, to activation keys. So here those activation keys are um, well a bit more complicated in their name structure though they label um, the, the distribution and version encoded in a simple word. So for Ubuntu, we just use the code name of the distribution. For CentOS, we just write CentOS and the, the major release, the same for Red Hat and SUSE Linux. 
Um, each activation key belongs to a certain environment. So these are the environments we already encountered uh, in, the, in the area here, lifecycle environments. And if you, for example, go to bionic prod, you can see that the, this belongs to the environment production and to some content view. You can also see that it subscribes to several products now. So an activation key brings together products, content views, life cycles. So a host, if I deploy it and uh, perform all the settings, the initial settings, always has an activation key and a content view. Um, also, if you like register existing hosts to your Ocarina, you can use this activation key and use a tool called Subscription Manager. You would call it on a command line um, using a um, command which is given here. So Subscription Manager, register, and then activation key, which will automatically register your host using this activation key. So making available all the products which are in the subscription and all the repositories that are within the content view, which is, um, which is um, assigned to your host. We now here have this composite um, content view. And I will go back to our content view to quickly explain what this is. We can combine normal content views to something called a composite content view. And actually these composite content views is what we are using for the deployment later. So these single things are required for having the version management of the repositories, but the composite content views contain everything that might be needed for your host. So let's go to the composite Ubuntu 18.04. And uh, of course, again, we first land on a page with the versions, which is the same as for a single con content view. Again, we have several versions um, and the date when those have been published. And now we see that for the composite content views, also the other lifecycle environment appears. That's why, that's because we only register uh, our host to these composite content views. That makes it a bit easier um, because we don't have to care for this detailed organization of our simple um, content views. And you see the newest version is development, version 15 points to testing and version 14 to production. I could promote, for example, also version 15 um, to point to production. That would mean all my hosts registered as production systems would get version 15 of my lifecycle, of my composite content view, which of course then results in possible upgrades of software. Before, you would have no available upgrades so easily, let's say. Okay, um, one last thing, how to prepare new hosts for your life cycle environments um, is through the host groups. Again, we have a list of already quite familiar names. So, well, you might get the impression that it's kind of redundant, but actually these are technically very different things. And eventually also help you to organize all your content. If you have a look here at the Ubuntu 18.04 prod, which is the host group I earlier selected for the creation of the new host. And if I select this, I can see how a host in this host group is by default configured. And you see this belongs to the lifecycle environment testing, which is kind of misleading. Um, should be production, sorry for that. Um, you see the content view, which is made available for it. And if you go to the rightmost tab, you see there's activation keys, and this is the Bionic prod.
Okay. So, like, made this in a quick, easy statement. You have a lot of levels. Um, it's important to know that you have like one large collection of packages. You have content views which choose certain versions of your packages and publish them through the content views. And you have activation keys which um, bring this connection between your host and uh, Ocarino to organize which packages are available for that host. Um, all this logic is then um, kind of replicated through certain certificates also. So let's have a look what our host does. So the one we just deployed some minutes ago. Okay, we have a host called Webinar Demo and it is labeled as red. What does this mean? First of all, we see there's a status which is error and we have some systems, uh, some items below. This status, the overall status always refers to the worst status found below. In this case, the errata status is red. So the overall status is the red. <clears throat> so what is an erratum? Let me quickly explain what this is. Um, this originates from the Red Hat world. An erratum is some kind of meta information. It contains a description of an, a secu security vulnerability and which software updates would remedy this security vulnerability. Red Hat invented this for its own hosts. Um, we have ported this system also, system also to Debian. Um, I think it's easier understandable if we just have a look at, at some of those. So we can click here. So maybe this was a bit quick. Let's go back. Um, so we have a button here about the content. The content um, visualizes all the software installed and intended to be installed on our host. So the agent software, which is installed on our host, communicates with the Ocarino and lets it know which software is installed in which version. So Ocarino then can check which software is available and um, how uh, it can, this can be improved. So if I now go to this um, content, page, I see again here to which content view my system belongs to the lifecycle environment and by which activation key it has been registered. Um, there's a lot of other information. This depends also a bit on the distribution you're using. You see here, for instance, if the Catalo agent is installed, which is a kind of an agent software, um, which opens a service on your host so that Ocarino can contact it through this agent, which is, well, not the future, um, but this is the original way of how Ocarino communicated with his clients. Um, we now choose a different approach because this Catalo agent never existed for Debian-like operating systems. But this is just a side note. Is nowadays, um, they are using some add-on for the package manager, which each time you call the package manager, creates a list of the installed software and sends it to the Ocarino um, that then can handle this somehow. So this is not the, the client approach, but really just the sending approach, which makes also the firewall rules a bit easier. Um, let's quickly um, ignore the errata. We see here that we have this uh, tab dep packages. In, in other distributions, it would be labeled packages simply. And if you click on applicable, we'll find a list of software that can be updated on our host. Um, so um, maybe you might wonder why there are 
packages not up to date on a freshly installed system. Actually, this is something we really prepare for the demonstration. Um, normally, so the default behavior is that all software is updated during installation, but we prevent this manually so that we can show that um, how update mechanism, for example, would work. You see, there's a lot of software that can be updated. Um, for example, the bzip2. Let's just try this one because it should not be too large. I tick it here and I say upgrade selected. I could also go to update all DAP packages, um, but this would take longer and we also want to have a look at the errata. So we say, I choose only one and say upgrade selected. And then we end up with uh, some new window, which is actually the, the job view. Um, the job view is, is the same for all kinds of jobs. So you can have very different kinds of jobs. Um, you see the overall status, which now is a success because we already installed this one new package and you see the list of hosts um, that this job gets applied to. So it's also possible to perform several upgrades on, on, on a list of hosts. And if I click on the name of the host, I will see the actual output of my command. You see the first one, if you are familiar with the Ubuntu, this is the, the list of the app get updates. So it um, refreshes its package cache and then installs the package. And eventually we will have one updated package. Okay, but um, maybe the, the more important thing is really the, the errata. So we still have security errata installable and we saw the number, it's 96 security errata. Um, you see there's also bug fixes and enhancements. Um, so the, originally the errata from Red Hat are labeled in these three categories um, to distinguish better what they actually refer to. Um, for Debian, this does not exist. So we only implemented the security errata. And I see that there is a question um, the package upgrade, how it is pushed to the client if there is no Catalo agent. This is uh, basically simply through SSH. So during deployment, um, a public key has been installed on the host and uh, then it's a remote execution through SSH. So we simply call um, SSH host name and upget install software name, basically. I hope this answers the question. Okay, um, so let's just have a look uh, at the security errata which are available. The list is quite long. Um, you see there is a title in this uh, line and then there's the uh, the number, the identifier, the unique identifier of this um, Ubuntu security advice. Let's have, for example, a look at the CSN4151, the Python vulnerabilities. So the title is actually not very well explaining. We can click on this and see uh, that um, there's a better description. Actually, this is not always the case for the Debian descriptions, um, but uh, in this case, it works quite well. So <clears throat> There's a, an error with the parsing of email addresses, which can be used to a cross-site scripting attack because you can enter um, malign code in some email address, for example. And this would be remedied by upgrading certain packages to those versions. Yeah, this is how this um, security are listed in this uh, overview. Okay, I don't want to have those, so I just check them and say apply selected. And now it asks me if I really want to apply the errata. Yes, I want to apply them. And then again, we end up in this job overview um, because now we have a lot of packages that would take a bit longer. Um, yeah. Eventually, you would not do this for each host alone. But you also can directly go to content and errata. 
sorry. And have a list of all the errata which are applicable to any of our systems. So this is a really important, I think, overview page. So here we would see all the errata which are applicable or installable. Um, so what does this mean? Um, applicable means that we have a host which is affected by this vulnerability and where Ocarina would recommend to install the corresponding update. But if it's not installable, it means that the corresponding package is not included in the host's current content view. Um, so this is a kind of a problem, of course, because how would this package then be made available for a host? For instance, let's say we have a host in production and we don't want to upgrade the, the whole content view. In that case, we could just include a selected package in my production content view and create a minor release of that content view. So you remember we had the version of our content view, uh, like 9.0, 9, uh, 10.0 and so on. And if you just want to include one package to remedy a security vulnerability, then it would, for example, become 9.2, 9.3, whatever. Um, it would increase both the minor version of the composite content view and the underlying simple content view. Um, yeah, I currently see that's just filter for installable. So for example, here we could check which server would be affected. If you click on this, we see again the description of the vulnerability. And we could also see here to which hosts these would apply. And now I could check the host and say apply to host if I want to specifically apply the security um, erratum. Okay, and what happened to our last job? Is it already finished? We can see this on the monitor and jobs. And we see there's install errata. This is the most recent job and it already succeeded. So we can click, um, which brings us to this job overview again. Now it's success. And if I go to the host, we see that it installed quite a lot of packages. Actually, the output is very long, 2,675 lines. If I now go to this host, the errata says all errata applied in the overall status is green. So that was my presentation of how patch management, lifecycle management and Ocarina works. I hope um, you uh, could follow it well. If you have any questions, I will remain here for the following minutes. Um, you, so feel free to ask any questions and we will try to answer them immediately, of course. Okay, there is one question I see. Um, so the question is if we can use the same user and the SSH key that he used by Ansible for configuration management also to deploy errata and uh, push upgrades. Yes, this is a straightforward yes. It, uh, so by default, it's just one SSH key that gets installed on the host machines and that is used for all the SSH connections. Um, actually, the other way around to have several SSH keys um, would make life more complicated, although it's still possible to do so. So you can have, um, let's say, purpose-based um, SSH keys, but uh, yeah, 
I think it's easier to have the same key. And so if you have prepared everything for Ansible, then the, then the Catalo agent basically is not required anymore. Okay, so feel free to send me any more questions. And I want to thank you for your attention and uh, hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.